Joining us now is the Democratic Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett of Texas. She's a member of the House Oversight Committee. She's a civil rights attorney. She's probably the only person more steamed about this than I am because you've, you've seen it in real life and up close. I don't understand. When somebody says, why would you make it that easy to vote? I, I'm, I'm from, I, I, I spend time in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, where they make it hard to vote. You've got to return your thing and put it in an envelope and sign both people. Why? This is all unnecessary. You know why. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why you're pretending you don't know what's going on. We know that the Republicans are lacking in any substance. We know that we are supposed to be policy makers, but when it comes down to time to actually make good policy, they don't have any good policy ideas. So how do you stay in power? You don't stay in power simply because you are actually trying to empower people and you are trying to make sure that their lives are better. You stay in power just by cheating. And so that's essentially what we have, especially in the state of Texas, you know, it's so rich that they wanted to claim fraud, 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 fraud. But when you look around, the only fraudsters that I see are within the Republican Party. Let's talk about George Santos. If we really care about fraud, then we definitely would make sure that he wasn't still sitting in the U.S. House. We also saw what recently happened this week in the Texas House with one of my freshman colleagues who was expelled, the first one that was expelled since 1927. You know why? Because he pretended that he was this man of family values. He was a former um, youth minister, yet he got caught up because he was doing sexual predatory things, kind of like the fraudster and sexual predator that we know as Trump. So, you know, they don't care about fraud. What they care about is cheating to win. Let's talk about, if we're unpacking everything, let's do it. We're talking about these billionaire-backed advocacy groups. Why are billionaires backing the idea that you make it harder for people to vote? What's the connection to you? Oh, this is very simple to me. You know, we're having the debt ceiling fight right now, right? The president has laid out his budget. In that budget, it actually would reduce our deficit by $3 trillion, right? But that's without cutting Medicaid. That's without cutting Medicare, Social Security, SNAP benefits, WIC. It's without doing those things and also making sure that we still provide for our veterans. But at the same time, those billionaires that are paying an effective tax rate of 8%, well, they would start paying their fair share. Because the last time I checked, when I look at my paycheck, I'm not paying 8%. I would love to, mm -hmm. but I'm not. Right. And so we know that the middle class, we know that the lower social economic struggling folk, we are actually enduring the brunt of the responsibility in this um, society. And so this is just about them making sure that they continue to stay on top, continue to make more and more money while the rest of us struggle. Meanwhile, these uh, things like voting rights, uh, things like trans rights, uh, they're becoming a really important focus of the Republican Party. It strikes me because they can be. Um, it, it strikes me that targeting uh, trans kids is just easy. It's 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 just an easy thing to do. Um, you kick somebody when you while you can. Yeah, I mean, here's the deal. Most people are emotional, right? When you decide who you're going to vote for, it's who makes you feel good. It's who you like. It's who understands you or who riles you up, whether they're getting you angry or whether they make you happy, right? And so this is them saying, you know what? Because we still have no policies, let's get angry about this thing over here. But I have knocked doors, not just in Texas. I've knocked doors in Wisconsin. I've knocked doors in uh, Georgia. And let me tell you, I have never knocked a door and somebody said, you know, those little trans kids, we got a problem with them. What mm -hmm. you going to do about that? Mm -hmm. That is not a real thing. That is a thing that they make up. Uh, Congresswoman, I, I want to first of all thank you. I know you were on my show, and I wasn't even on my show uh, last weekend, so I appreciate that. Um, you, you did mention the, the, the budget situation, the, the debt ceiling. I, I have to ask you this question. There apparently are negotiations going on, and apparently uh, Kevin McCarthy is going to be talking to President Biden about this. Can Kevin McCarthy even make a deal, or is he, is he sort of uh, you know, stuck with these uh, sort of that chaos part of his party that just doesn't want to make a deal? No, you know, listen, we saw, everybody saw, the entire world saw how hard it was for him to get his precious speakership in the first place. And we know that it's hanging in the balance by a thread. And unfortunately, this is no way to govern. And so seemingly he cares more about his title than he cares about the people of the United States. And that's a problem. And so, no, I don't know that McCarthy really has the gumption to do what is right. We know 
that this debt ceiling was raised three times, not once, not twice, but three times under Trump. We also know that 25 percent of the bills that have been piled up, they were piled up in four years under one president. That's President Trump. So right now he's telling us, don't pay my bills, but you were the one that created the debt. That is problematic. The Republican legislative crusade against the LGBTQ community is continuing at full speed, with the ACLU recording nearly 500 anti-LGBTQ bills this year alone proposed. They're not all passed, many of which specifically pertain to transgender Americans. Now, so far this year, 70 anti-trans bills have been passed nationwide. This week, Missouri became the latest state to do so. On Wednesday, its Republican-controlled legislature passed a bill that would create a near-total ban on gender-affirming care for minors, regardless of parental consent. consent. Missouri's Republican governor has expressed support for the legislation and is expected to sign it into law. One Missouri family raising a 16-year-old transgender son had this to say about the bill. This is um, medical care that is our son's doctors say he needs, that we as parents think he needs, and that he wants. The path that my child was on before we got to the gender center was the wrong path. And it's devastating to know that other kids aren't going to have access to that same health care. Now, Missouri officials on Wednesday also passed legislation that would require schools to force transgender students to compete on athletic teams that reflect the sex that they were assigned at birth. As a result of that legislation, a board member of one of Missouri's largest school districts, through tears, announced that she will not only be resigning from her position, it's also leaving the state completely to protect her transgender child. As a family, we have made the difficult but necessary decision that Missouri is no longer a safe place for us. Now, both of those bills would give Republican legislatures, uh, legislators an outsized impact on the daily lives of transgender kids in Missouri. It would give Republican politicians more power than their parents to determine the best way to protect and care for their own kids. What if it was your child? Because all of these children are somebody's children. There are kids and families that are harmed by this Republican frenzy. Our next two guests are both parents of children who identify as transgender or non-binary. Debbie Jackson and Rabbi Daniel Brogard are part of the community fiercely fighting these bills in Missouri and elsewhere. Today, Rabbi Brogard wrote, whipping up fear and hatred against trans people, trans kids in particular, is not a sideshow in today's GOP. It's the lifeblood of their coalition. They're waging a war on democracy, and the bodies of trans kids are what they've chosen for their battlefield. Joining us now, Rabbi Daniel Bogard of the Central Reform Congregation in St. Louis. He's a parent of a nine-year-old transgender boy. Also with us, Debbie Jackson, a member of the Human Rights Campaign's Parents for Transgender Equality Council. She's the parent of Avery, a 15-year-old non-binary child. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for uh, being with us. Rabbi, uh, I, I just want to read a, a, another of your tweets in which you said, because this is interesting, it follows on the conversation I just had with Jasmine Crockett. You said, I really believe that most of the Republicans, uh, Republican electeds genuinely don't like these bills targeting trans kids. They've just realized that torturing my kid and my family is winning politics for them. The base loves it, and the press covers the story as the debate over trans kids. So first of all, for the benefit of the press, for the benefit of us in the media, tell me what's wrong with the way we're covering this. You know, look, what's happening is the Republican Party is waging a war on trans kids. It really feels like they are waging here in Missouri a war on my family. And then so often what happens in the press is this is treated like a question. Let's talk about this whole trans thing that's going on without centering the harm and the pain that is being caused to kids, right? Just kids who are trying to be themselves, who are trying to live their lives, and families who are trying to follow the best advice of their doctors. Uh, so when the press centers the debate rather than centering the harm, it, it continues this cynical policy of the Republicans who are counting on it. They're counting on the fact that they can rile up their base with anti-trans rhetoric and get questions from the other side. Debbie, to the extent that this is political uh, and that maybe uh, the rabbi's right, that, that, that this, this uh, activates and, and, and uh, animates a base, you're, you're at the, the heart of it. You, you and your family are at the heart of this. How does it feel from your perspective? Um, well, thank you for having us on tonight. Yes, we have been at the heart of it. I started my advocacy publicly about a decade ago, and for eight years, 
I have been going back and forth because we're on the Kansas City line with Kansas. Um, for eight years, I've been going back and forth to the state legislatures in both states, sometimes for hearings on the same day in both states, just literally driving back and forth, begging people to acknowledge our kids and that they are just a regular part of the community. Um, it's painful to me, as you said, um, they frame it as a debate or an issue. And um, I'm sure the rabbi will agree with me that our children's gender is not an issue. Hmm. And it, it's not a debate. Their existence is not up for debate. And that's what we've been trying to say for so long. Trans people exist. And we're tired of them being, being used by these organizations that have such deep pockets, like the Heritage Foundation and the Alliance Defending Freedom. Um, this is not something that's homegrown. This is all completely manufactured because they know that division and, and bigotry sells. Rabbi, I want to just play for our audience. We were talking about your nine-year-old son. You have a 12-year-old son um, as well who testified against uh, an anti-trans sports bill um, and, and referred in it uh, in the testimony to your other son. Let's listen. It's been years that you have been trying to take things away from people that I love who are just little kids. They're not competing for a scholarship or a job, and most of the time they're not even in the tournament. They're just trying to have fun, which they can't do since you're trying to pass these bills. This has affected my brother because now he gets scared that he will not be able to do what he loves. Rabbi, talk to me about that um, because you say we're not, you know, we could do a better job of centering the harm. Let's talk about that. You, you have another son who's not trans um, who is really hurt by the fact that his brother's getting targeted by these, these pieces of legislation. Yeah, my 12 year old has been going down for years now to testify in support of his brother, in support of uh, another good friend of his who's trans. But the other background piece here is my 12 year old goes because we don't allow our nine year old to go to testimony days because the things that our sitting legislators say about our kids are so vile and they are so hurtful that, that we just don't want our child to hear that. I've been in the room when sitting senators have asked 12 year olds what their genitals look like. We've had legislators offer uh, to kids, you know, do you need to be taken away from your parents? Do you need to be protected from them who are trying to trans you? We'll have people in committee hearings say that the reason that our kids are trans is because of mental illness or because we didn't love them enough as parents. And it is heartbreaking and we refuse to let our nine-year-old hear those things. You know, he lives in this perfect bubble of love and acceptance. We're genuinely the only bullies in his life work for the Missouri government. That's wild. Um, Debbie, do you, do you share the rabbi's view that, that most people probably wouldn't have come to these sort of anti-trans views on their own if this wasn't a, a sort of a whipped up frenzy? Oh, 100%. 100%. When people actually do get to know our families and they see that we are just their, their neighbors, their friends, um, that we go to the same grocery stores, we're in the schools, we're sitting in congregations on... Uh, you know, and worshiping with them, they they recognize that there is nothing frightening about us, that we are not um, abusers, that we are loving families. And um, what really disturbs me is that this is government interference and overreach in such an egregious way. But because they're using this dehumanizing language, they make it sound like um, the, the names of the bills that they the, they need to protect children from something, it makes it sound reasonable. But when they take a step back and the people in the community get to know our families, they realize that it's anything but reasonable. And we need them to understand once they have done this to trans people, they will need another scapegoat that's mm -hmm. out there and they will come for another community next. And I appreciate that you have had on people talking about the extreme violence because there are things they could be doing to actually protect children across this country right now, today, and they're not doing it. Instead, they're trying to distract and put a focus on this marginalized community of people just because there aren't enough people who know a trans person. So I think what you said there really crystallizes it, uh, Debbie. And Rabbi, I think this is interesting because Debbie said, you know, once they've done with this, they'll, they'll go to some other marginalized group. You know about this, right? You know that you can whip up a frenzy about anybody. You can other anybody in this country. This just seems to be the turn uh, for, for, for trans people in this country. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. You know, the, there's that classic poem, yep. uh, God forbid, about the Holocaust. The first they came for this group and, and we did nothing because we weren't that group. And, you know, I always I always 
hoped and believed that this was prescriptive, that that told us how to behave and, and pointed us towards a better future. And I tell you, living here in Missouri, living with a trans kid where our government is at war with us, where we feel like we need to protect our kid from our state, I'm desperately scared that this is descriptive of how humans live and how humans respond. And it's terrifying being here. Tremaine, it's been a year and it's been uh, immeasurable shootings uh, since. And some of them are, 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 I mean, I can't even say this. Some of them are just mass shootings and some of them are motivated by hatred and extremism. Um, and it's very easy to forget. Uh, what happened a year ago. If I said to somebody what happened a year ago in America, I'm not sure they'd even remember that there was this mass shooting of people because of the color of their skin in Buffalo. But that's not so easy to do if you're in Buffalo and you're black. Not at all, Ali. You imagine the, the, the cities that have had to deal with this. And once the cameras go and once the politicians yep. leave, they're left to hold uh, the enormous weight of the trauma um, and really the, the, the bloodshed, right? And so even though there is no manual, there is no roadmap, one thing that I find amazing, uh, it speaks to the resilience of people, is that even when uh, those promises have faded and the lights and cameras are gone, these communities are trying to stand up in their own and help their own communities, right? Like the, the best bomb for these communities is often the community itself. You mentioned the woman I spoke with named Trinetta Austin. Before the pand before the, the, the tragedy, she was focused on ch uh, children and immunization and vaccinations. Hmm. But after this, she's tending to those wounds that are harder to spot. And they actually found time to form uh, a sisterhood with some of the folks and brotherhood with some of the folks at the top supermarket, give them a shoulder to, to laugh on and cry on. And it, there is laughter coming back through this bond. And so through this immense tragedy, we think about 10 lives. If you have two people killed in any incident, that is horrific, 10. And so many of the folks that are still dealing with the memories, many of those folks have actually gone back to that supermarket to work, even though it's been remodeled, even though it's been refurbished. Um, the, the, the pain is seeped into that floor. What is, uh, you know, Tremaine, sadly, I, I, I go to almost all of these shootings, um, and many of them are places that were not famous for anything. They're, they're now famous for being a place where there was a mass shooting. And you're right. Once, you know, in the, in, the, in the days following a shooting, there's nothing but media all over the place. And then they leave. And then they leave. And it is empty and hollow. And, and there will guaranteed be another shooting soon after to steal those headlines. What... Do, did the people you talked to want the rest of us to know about this? That they're still standing. And I think the one thing that was kind of sad to hear, but also very human, is that we remember the names and the faces of those 10 mm -hmm. people who lost their lives, whose lives were stolen from uh, their communities and their families and their loved ones. But we don't talk much about uh, those who survived, yep. right? Either survived actually getting shot or those who survived and had to witness these horrific events. They wanted folks to know that they are still there, but they also need help. And it's not in terms of like donations, but they need love. They need a legislation. They need prayers. But as you mentioned earlier, you know, what happens when someone targets you because you're black? What happens when they target your community because it is a majority black community? And racism and white supremacy created the, board, the borders and boundaries around some of these communities anyway, especially East Buffalo, where this shooting happened. Um, and then they were targeted because they're black. So they're left to carry all that. And so even though they're standing up, even though they're doing what they can to help each other, and they are laughing more than they had a year ago, mm -hmm. uh, they, folks know that they're still suffering. Tremaine, did, do people make a distinction there uh, about what of this was racism and what of it was our out-of-control gun situation in this country? It's both, but how do they think about it? In, in this case, it, it's almost entirely about um, being targeted because they were black, because one Another thing that emerged that I heard time and again, and it's it's a sad state of affairs, is that folks were used to hearing some gunshots in this community, but these shots sounded differently, right? And the motivation was much different. This is an urban community with many of the issues that uh, many other urban communities all across this country face, including everyday uh, gun violence. And so it wasn't necessarily just the insanity of how many people are shot and killed and how many illegal weapons are flooding communities like these Buffalo. It's the fact that this... Um, young white supremacists targeted them, planned to come there, came there the day before, scouted out. Some of the folks who were there that day of the shooting were there the prior day when he came and, and talked to some folks and, and um, you know, did some reconnaissance at the store. And so for these folks, it's certainly the, um, the impact of the bloodshed itself. But, um, you know, first on that list is that they were targeted because they were black.